So I belong to a family of lawyers. My wife, Nina, and my daughters, Sonia, Priya, Shilpa, they are also lawyers. Only one daughter, she's a jewelry designer. My son is connected with law. So our family conveys our heartfelt, sincere, and deepest condolences to Zena, to Zia, to Hormat, and to Jahangir. Our condolences to you on the passing away of someone whom we thought that he belongs to everyone, not just to your family. And I have had a long association. And during the three minutes that I have got, I'll just highlight, you see, three, three or four dates which are relevant. One is, and I go back to the year 1969-70, when I briefed solely for the first time in Bombay High Court in a matter of JK Synthetics Limited, where the excise duty had been imposed without giving any hearing to the company. So Soli appeared and he was before Justice Pence and he just said one, one sentence, my Lord, we have not been heard. Then the government counsel got up. He said, if your Lordship will hear me before you pass any order, Justice Pence said, no, you first hear them and then he passed the interim order, you see, in our favor. That was the advocacy, you see, which uh, Soli had. Then year 1977, you see, people are aware of the qualities of head and heart, which Soli had. The law reports are, are full, you see, of the monumental and important cases which where Soli appeared and uh, got the development of the constitutional law in this country during his seven decade tenure as a lawyer. So I will not touch upon what he did as a lawyer. I will just say 1977, I was the chairman of the Bar Council appointed by the then Congress government, emergency government. At that time, there was no election. It was a nomination by the government. So I was nominated as the chairman. My term was over. My term was not over actually. And I approached Soli who became the attorney general. And I said, Soli, um, I want to resign because the government has a right to appoint someone else as the attorney general. Soli said, no, nothing doing. You please complete your term and we will see later on what happens. That was the quality of heart which he had, you see. Then the year 1986, why I'm pointing out that time Justice Pathak, R.S. Pathak became the Chief Justice of India. And he approached, you see, just uh, Mr. Soli Surabji that he said, I'm very keen that there should be something, some big event on law and medicine it has never been done in India. And I want to see people, experts from outside, you see, to participate and tell us what is the connection between law and medicine. And this subject was very close to Soli's heart. So he asked me, Lalit, will you organize all this? I said, certainly, it's a very, very important issue. <laughs> it's a very important issue. And we had a massive successful event in which the leading lights in the field of law and medicine, they participated. That was law and medicine. Unfortunately, we have situation today that we have only the laws, but no medicine today, particularly you see for COVID. And ironically, solely fell a victim, you see, to this COVID thing. Then the year 1991, I lost my wife Madhu and she was under treatment, you see, in 
New York. Soli came to know that I was in New York. He came to see me and my wife, and who was in the hospital, just to offer his full support, moral support to us. And I really cherish, you see, that moment when he came and he saw Madhu and me there together. Then years passed by, we kept our contact. Finally, 2021 month was about February when both Nina and I, we approached Soli. We said, Soli, we want to capture your life and we want to get a message from you for the coming generation of the lawyers. He said, of course. And that is where on behalf of the Society of Indian Law Firms, we captured the life and the message of Soli Sorabji in an episode, which is already on YouTube and which you will, it's a short episode of about 19 minutes, which you will have the benefit to see. I think it was the last recorded video uh, of Soli Sorabji's interview, which is available for all of us to see. And we are circulating that, you see, to all the law schools all over the country so that they can benefit from the wisdom, you see, and the pearls that fell from Soli Sorabji's uh, interview. And they, they'll take benefit out of that. So with this now, I request the honorable worthy speakers I will first request the Attorney General of India, Mr. K.K. Venugopal, to please speak about Soli Sorabji. Thank you, Lalit. Zina, Zia, my friends. This is a sad day. At the same time, we are celebrating the life of a person who has carved a niche for himself not merely in the legal fraternity, but in India as a whole. I had yesterday recounted some of my fond memories of a long association with Soli. I spoke of our time together as additional solicitors general in the late 70s, when he appeared together in a large number of cases during the Janata regime and of the many delicious meals which courtesy Zina, his wonderful wife, had uh, extended by way of hospitality to me because I was alone at that time here as additional solicitor general, having come over from Madras. When you think of Soli, one would imagine a legend of the law, a great jurist, an attorney general twice over, an awardee of the second highest civilian honor that the state can give, the Padma Vibhushan. And above all, a lawyer who was innovative and who was part of the evolution of the Constitution of India. According to me, his success in SR Bombay, and that's a case which I think is one of, uh, after Keshavan and the Bharati and so on, is of uh, seminal importance. It, by say by Bombay is one of the feathers in his cap. The judgment had prevented the abuse of federalism and democracy in the country by the central government dismissing state governments on some pretext or other, and then taking over the governance of that particular state. This is totally contrary to federalism and solely took the case to court. And in the Supreme Court, a bench of nine judges were persuaded by his elaborate arguments to hold that the state government would be dismissed only when an impasse arises, where it cannot be, the government cannot be run in accordance with the constitution and therefore creates a situation which cannot be remedied and not otherwise. And the judgment was a death blow as it were to the consistent and frequent abuse of power by the governments at the center, dismissing and taking over the governance of state. And the reason why I consider it to be important is, I was appearing for Karnanidhi, where during the height of emergency, 
the fact that he, that on the allegation that he had taken bribes in the wheat deal case, was sufficient to dismiss the entire government where the central government could never hope to come into the state of Tamil Nadu and uh, the Congress government could never govern. And today, if, uh, the, uh, if corruption was the basis for uh, dismissal of governments, I wonder how many of these governments could possibly survive because every one of them would write and uh, left. Uh, fall, uh, uh, fall down because they could be dismissed without just on the ground of uh, an allegation of uh, corruption, which is easy to make. I think that this is one of his greatest successes. And we have found that after this judgment, the question of dismissing a government under 356 has become very, very rare indeed. Soli was a dine at the bar, and uh, as everybody knows, he was a multifaceted being and was not only a great lawyer, but a lover of poetry, lover of music, a lover of literature, a gourmet, and above all, a great human being. I, I loved horses and used to ride for a number of years in Madras, in the Madras Riding Club. And knowing this, Soli told me that his father had a string of horses. And after he passed away, he took quite an interest in racing horses and even took that string of horses to Colombo for the purpose of racing. And all this at the age of 19. We should therefore consider ourselves fortunate that Soli had decided that racing horses was not his future. And on the other hand, it was law. And what a great success he has been in the legal profession. He recently celebrated his 91st birthday in style. But I excuse myself because of my age and my lung condition. As doctor said, uh, advised me not to get into crowds. I, however, wrote him a letter with wishing him all the best on his birthday and said that I would call on him personally to congratulate him. I had decided to take a rare single malt as a birthday present. And I called him. He took the telephone and told me that he would call me back later. He did not do so. And I felt hurt. A few days later, I therefore uh, called Pinky Anand and uh, asked her, because she used to visit him uh, off and on, and asked her, would you uh, go and visit uh, Soli and find out, uh, is, has he got anything against me? Why is it that he had not called me back? For Pinky Anand told me later that she called him and said that she would like to go over and see him. And Soli told her the same thing that uh, I will call you back. He never called me, he never called Pinky Anand. And the next we heard was that he had passed away on account of COVID. Obviously, he did not want to expose me or Pinky Anand to the dreadful disease. Truly, I have lost a great and a good friend. I once again offer my deepest condolences to Zina, Zia, and the two sons. Thank you. I now request uh, the acknowledged leader of the Indian Bar, Mr. Fali Nariman, a contemporary of Soli Swarabji, to please share his views with us about Mr. Swarabji, Mr. Fali S. Nariman. Thank you, Lalit. Only last Wednesday, a mutual friend, now the oldest and senior most living member of the bar, said it all on the edit editorial page of the Indian Express. He described Soli as a fighter for rights and said that he was a man who died in honor and glory. And only yesterday, at another function such as this, more tributes were paid to Soli's brilliant advocacy, as well as to his charm and grace as a human being. 
Permit me today to add a footnote to these rich and well-deserved tributes. In the past three years, whenever Soli and I met, which was not often, but it was not seldom either, we would greet each other with an exchange of reminiscences, not about the cases that we appeared in on opposite sides. To us, that was stale stuff. We would attempt to recall tales of old that had been narrated by our great super senior in whose chamber each of us had been privileged to be admitted decades ago. The chamber of Sir Jamseji Kanga, the uncut diamond of the Bombay Bar, as Chief Justice Chagla had once described him. I propose to narrate to you, friends, just two stories from Kanga's chamber, stories to which Soli and I were initially both listeners as very young juniors. These were the two stories of old times that Soli and I had exchanged at what I now, only now, with regret realize was our very last meeting in this world. Soli had reminded me of the first such story. And this is how it goes. Once long ago, a very old senior advocate of the Bombay High Court had walked into our chamber in the High Court building while Soli and I were sitting around Sir J.B. Kanga's table. Jangirji, that was his first name, had come to see Sir Jamsedji on a somewhat delicate matter and kept looking at us furtively. But neither of us then had the good sense or the good manners to withdraw. We kept sitting and listening in as we always there were no secrets in the chamber of Sir Jam. It transpired that Jangiji had come to seek advice and solicit sympathy from Sir Jamseji. And his problem was, as he explained, that he had been a fixture as counsel in the court of a particular judge of the Bombay High Court. And that judge, having recently retired, as all High Court judges do at 62 years, Jangiji had been left without any work in court. Jamseji, apro future soon? He asked. Jamseji, what about my future? With a frown on his fair complexion, Jamseji, all six foot four inches of him, drew himself straight up in his chair and in an imperious, slightly angry voice said, Jangir, Tari Ummar Sun, Jangir, how old are you? And Jangirji, looking at us again, sheepishly said, almost in a whisper, Beyasi, 82. And the sprightly Jamsedji, age 92, shot back at him, Ek Pag Golma, future with one leg in the grave what are you commiserating about your future <laughs> always a positive thinker jamseji believed that after 80 a lawyer should hang up his boots as he himself had done after 80 he meticulously came to the chamber each working day but did not make an appearance in any court poor old jangiji finding no sympathetic response to his plea, then withdrew as sheepishly as he had entered. This was Soli's story that he remembered and narrated on the last occasion that we met. Not to be outdone, I reminded Soli of another of Kanga's stories, which Kanga had got secondhand from one Lord Dunedin when they were both traveling by ship from England to Aden in the late 1920s. 
Ganga was returning to Bombay from the United Kingdom, where he would always spend his summer vacation. And Lord Dunedin was a senior law lord in England from 1913 right up to the year 1932 and was taking a sea trip to Aden and back. Lord Dunedin told Kanga a story against himself. He said when he dozed off in the House of Lords, listening to the boring speeches of counsel, his colleagues who sat with him complained. Not only does our good Lord Dunedin fall asleep during the hearings, but when asleep, he also snores and thus disturbs the sleep of the other law lords. I have in my study in Delhi a picture of a famous painting of a young lawyer with arms outstretched, arguing before a judge who is fast asleep. And the legend below the picture records the young lawyer telling the court clerk who sits below the judge, Charlie, wake up his lordship. And the court clerk answers back, you wake him up. You put him to sleep in the first place. With these stories of old, ladies and gentlemen, I close my case, but not before recommending to Lalit and his list of firms that we make this today's sad occasion a happy commemorative annual event so that Soli's restless soul is regaled at least once a year with tales of fun and laughter since this was how he lived his long and eventful life. Thank you. Thank you, Fali. I can assure you that we are going to institutionalize this and uh, definitely make it a commemorative event annually. Definitely, sir. Now, our uh, next speaker, I don't see him, Mr. Tushar Mehta. Is he there? No. Then we pass on to Mr. Vikas Singh, the president of the Supreme Court Bar Association. Not once, but I think a couple of times more. So, Mr. Vikas Singh, please. Mr. Lalit Basim, the family members of Mr. Sorabji who are here on screen and who are also not there. My association with Mr. Sorabji was sometime in the year 1990 when I joined the Supreme Court. I remember in the first case when I went to brief him on behalf of the Rajasthan spinning and weaving bills. He read the brief. And after reading the brief, he said, because <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm not convinced. I said, but sir, I felt that there is something to argue. He said, but I have to be convinced. If I am not convinced, I am not going to argue. So this was the stature of the man that any amount of money was not you know, important for him to decide whether he'll argue or not. He had to be convinced. And that was my very important lesson, which I learned in my life, that as a lawyer, before you start arguing, you have to be convinced yourself. I remember in the year 2005, when I had a, a, a tip the Supreme Court with regard to the uh, constitution of the Forest Advisory Committee, I said the government cannot, the court cannot compel the government to have somebody in a statutory committee it is the prerogative of the government to decide. The same day rang me up and he said, Vikas, I'm so proud of you that you could take such a bold stand and tell that this is how government should be allowed to function. And there is a clear separation of powers. The other thing which I remember of Soli is the, the personality of his, the stature that he had. When Vajpayee was the prime minister, and the Soli was the attorney general, and these licenses, telecom licenses, had been given a very high fixed license fee, and they were unable to pay the amount. The Soli Sorabji was consulted as the attorney general, and he suggested that if the license, if the telecom companies are to survive in this country, or if they are supposed to go on, then the only way it can be done is by converting them from a fixed license fee to a revenue share model. And at the advice of the Attorney General, 
the contract which was awarded by a open tender was converted by the government without any tender on the advice of the attorney general and today these companies are now on that revenue share model if such kind of a thing had happened in anybody else's tenure i am sure it would have resulted in a huge hue and cry of how a existing licensee who has been awarded a license by means of a public tender can be con- completely by changing the terms of the license itself where the money to be coming to the government was far far less than what was to come uh, at, in the fixed license fee of course in the revenue share model the vision of uh, mr sorabzi can be seen now that in the revenue share model now of course the government is earning much more than probably could have earned in the fixed license fee so this was the personality this was the stature of the van nobody questioned him he was he was a legend and i i also agree with mr nariman that there should be an annual uh, this uh, the, some kind of a uh, um, uh, meet like this to keep the memory of solis or abji alive alive so that we can all recount our all of our, our small memories with him and cherish his life thank you thank you mr vikas singh i'm informed that now mr tushar mehta is uh, available and uh, uh, mr tushar mehta the solicitor general are you there no i can't find him anyway so i would now request mr kapil sibal to pay his tribute to mr soli sorab ji mr sibal as all of you know is not only a senior counsel but has been a minister you see uh, holding different portfolios and a very distinguished member of the indian bar so over to you mr kapil sibal thank you lalit um you've given us about 3 minutes to talk about a man uh whose lifetime cannot be and the milestone of his lifetime cannot be encapsulated in the short span of 3 minutes i joined the bar sometimes in 1974 the beginning of 1974 and solely came to the supreme court i think around 1975 as additional solicitor general and i have watched solely admired solely the years that he was practicing and learnt a lot from him in fact if you look at the constitutional history of india which is built brick brick by brick you will find in every brick the imprint of solely sarabji that is his constitute is his contribution to the constitutional law of india we know about his passion for human rights his passion for freedom of speech his passion for liberty and he never wavered in that passion no matter which government was in power but let me tell you about a story which tells you what a great man soli was do there are i was on mute that i was a member of his team when he was attorney general between 1819 18 uh, 9 and 1990 and along with me was um, um santosh hegde and arun jetli we were three additional solicitor general in that team and when the government was formed um, uh, chaudhry devilal was the deputy prime minister at that point in time and my when my appointment came through Chaudhry Devi Lal, who was then the Deputy Prime Minister, rang up Soli and said, and in fact told the Prime Minister and said that this guy that you have got is a congressman, and therefore he should be made to resign. And if he doesn't resign, I shall resign. This is the public statement that Chaudhry Devi Lal made. Soli called me up, and he said, Kapil, this is the situation. What do we do? I said, It's up to you. You don't want? I'll I'll put in my papers. he said why should you do that why should you put in your papers a few days passed and then he called me up again and he said this time the law minister 
uh, Mr. Goswami at that at that point time time he was the law minister. Uh, he has called me and said that look tell Kapil to give his resignation letter, and I will keep it in my pocket. I will just show it to Devi Lal so that I satisfy his ego, but I will not hand it over to the government. So Sony again called me and said like, what do what do we do? And I said up to you. He said nothing doing. You will not give any letter of resignation. Let us see what they do. Ultimately, they'll have to come to me. And so we continued. And of course, the government fell within a year. But that was the metal of the man. He would stand by you. And he would look after you. I remember when I joined the profession very early. Uh, and Zina will remember that. Uh, there was some dispute about the Baha'i Temple. And as a young lawyer, he, he was always looking out for young people who, was, who were doing okay. So then they got in touch with me and I was trying to help them out in respect of that dispute uh, in respect of the, the, the Baha'i Temple in Delhi. And over the years, we got very close, uh, exchanged a lot of things. He was very close to my father. And every time I met him in the Supreme Court, even when he, when he found it difficult to come, he would always, he would always hold my hand. And, and, and he would say to me, uh, I remember your dad. I'm so happy that your children are doing so well. And we always exchanged, um, you know, words that, that, that because of the bond that we had built up over the years. His contributions of the law are phenomenal. I mean, I think he changed the whole concept of, of Article 14, 19, and 21 in Menika Gandhi. That's the case that he argued in 1978. And of course, there are many other milestones. I don't want to talk about them. But let me say this, that he was a man of many parts. The freedom that jazz musicians, musicians have is the kind of freedom that he wanted in his life because of the diversity of his interests. His love for literature, which I think he passed on to his children. I, 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 I read the other day, Jahangir quoting T.S. Eliot. Uh, and of course, Zia, who is, uh, you know, uh, he's done, all his children have done him proud. And Zia ha has, has shown the way uh, to, to, to women lawyers in this country. So in a sense, Soli's contributions to the law, Soli as a human being, Soli... Uh, who, as a person who had enormous empathy, solely as a friend, uh, nobody can forget. He will be remembered for all times to come, for many, many years, for his contributions to the law and his love for life and poetry. My deepest condolences, heartfelt condolences to Zina, to Zia, to Jangi, to Hormuz, and to all his friends. We are sad today, but we know that he left behind memories that we will always cherish. Thank you. Thank you. If uh, Mr. Tushar Mehta is available, then he will be the next. And then I now request uh, one of the most distinguished lawyers which our country has produced, Mr. Harish Salve, to please pay his tribute to Mr. Soli Swarabji. He had the privilege of working very closely with Mr. Swarabji. So over to you, Harish. Thank you, Lalit. My heartfelt condolences to my family, Zena, Sia, Jangir, Ormat, Jamshed. Because as I said the other day, I al always considered myself, sorry Zina, not to horrify you. I've always considered myself as fifth born. And he always treated me that way. Soli the lawyer is well known. Not so well known as Soli the father. Solely the friend, solely 
the jazz aficionado. Soli the lawyer, my guru, was a hard taskmaster. He worked us really hard. When I first went to him to join his chambers, he said to me in Marathi, Tel kadin tuza. I will take the oil out of you. I told him, Karan as I push I have a lot of oil in me. Please feel free to do that. And he did. And the only reason we couldn't complain was because he worked himself harder. His sharp voice sometimes would make lawyers tremble. All of us who briefed him know that. But as a father, I've seen him tremble at Zia's voice. I can never forget when Zia beat up a mugger in New York and then decided to go and give evidence against him. Soli came, held my hand and said, Sung karu babu. <laughs> I said, Soli, if it was anybody else, we could have said, but with Zia, all you do is bow. She's not going to listen. And I don't think she did. Soli the friend was a very different man from Soli the lawyer. His love for his friends, as we all know, was almost proverbial. Soli's friends could do no wrong. Ever try telling him, so and so did something, and he said, Javadeni, Ravadeni, let it go, let it go. He would never hold a grudge. Grudges were something alien to his very being. And if you were his friend who was fond of jazz, you then had a very special place in his heart. I have seen Soli's mood change faster than even London weather. Sitting upstairs in chambers, growling on someone who was not properly prepared or a, or a matter which was hopeless and somebody was trying to push that he argue something which he was not convinced. Five minutes later, walking off because Rudy was waiting for him in the study downstairs. And the same Soli was full of mirth, full of happiness. Soli was a great travel companion, a privilege which I have known. We went first time together to Kerala in 1983. I was very tense. My firstborn was on the way. And we sat and we chatted. I used to smoke those days. And Soli was an occasional smoker. I think between two of us, we went through a packet of cigarettes. And the next morning, he got up growling at me saying, I've almost lost my voice. What have you done to me? I was going to tell him, sir, do you think I had the courage to stop you from <laughs> smoking those two extra cigarettes? But he was great fun. We enjoyed ourselves. We chatted late into the evening. Soli and I went together to Paris in 1986 for an arbitration and a story which I always tell people. My love for extremely rare steaks is because of Soli's failed attempt at French. Those days there were hardly any English speaking waiters and we had to go for a quick lunch in between the hearing. Soli insisted on ordering in French. Instead of saying very well done, he ended up saying very rare. And the steak showed up almost oozing <laughs> the pink. And we had no time to get it cooked again. So Onkar Mathur, who was there, gave some sensible advice. He says, don't look at it, just eat it. <laughs> and that's how I developed a taste for rare beef. We spent so many evenings in London together. He used to come and stay at, I think it was Yosef's flat in, um, on Baker Street. We used to go to Ronnie's to hear jazz. And one secret, Soli loved his shirts. If you ever wanted to change his mood and get him into a better mood, you could say, Soli, let's go to Selfridges and buy a shirt. <laughs> Always willing. I've spent so many personal moments with him. He used to have a cervical problem. And one of the best times to have conversation with him was when I was massaging his back and I've done it more than once. I remember taking the stage on his 70th birthday where all of us who had had sufficient libations 
decided to sing whether or not we had a voice. And I can never forget the way he stood by my side at my mother's funeral. He was my strength. And that's why I say I've always considered myself his fifth born. Soli had a passion for English literature, a passion for poetry. And I will therefore only close by saying his life was gentle in the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. It was a great tribute coming from someone who worked so closely with Soli. I now request another leader of the Indian bar, that is Mr. Iqbal Chagla, we call him Mickey Chagla, to please share his tribute to Soli with us. Thank you. Uh, I see there are so many, the majority are all Delhi Wallas. So I'm going to talk about Soli, what I call the Bombay years. I joined the chambers of Khasiji Baba in 1962, and I, and I knew Soli since 1962. Uh, they were remarkable chambers, they were happy chambers. And uh, there was, apart from Baba's own table, the only other table was the one occupied by Fali Narima, being his first junior. And the rest of us were all accommodated in small little cubicles including Soli Sorabji. And this is where uh, the briefs were kept and this is where we worked. And uh, despite those handicaps, despite the lack of infrastructure, it's not that just Soli managed, his practice flourished. He had little interest in commercial litigation. His heart was in the constitution and in the writ court. If Fali commanded and mastered the commercial court, it was Soli who made the writ court almost his exclusive domain. And those were chambers where we had, I, I, when I sat in my little cubicle, I had Soli to my right and Ubed Chinoy on my left. And I think there were great learning moments in those days. Soli, uh, Soli had this remarkable memory. And uh, if one had a problem about some problem of proposition that you wanted, and you turned to Soli and asked him, Soli, you suggest anything on this? He said, yes, yes, of course, see 45 Bombay Law Reporter paid so-and-so. Or no, better still, why not see the Supreme Court in 1954 and it'd give you the page, the paragraph number, all of that. It was just an incredible thing to hear him, and he would tell you the particular passage where it was exactly. And this combined, combined with a mastery and felicity of language made for great advocacy. It was a treat to hear them in court. His persuasive best, and I think his favorite judges were Tulzapurka, Pense, and of course, Tarkundi. And this is where Soli's practice grew. And it was not just he, he loved the law, but it was not that he loved the law to the exclusion of everything else. His interests could never be confined in that way. His love of literature, his love of poetry, that was remarkable. And uh, he was, he'd, he'd be in court arguing some matter, matter would be over, he'd come down to chambers. He wouldn't turn to a law book or open a brief. He'd open a book of poetry or some literature that he was reading. And unlike his community, the Parsi community, it was not Western classical music that he loved. It was jazz. And as he always explained, that jazz, it, it was the improvisation in jazz, which was the soul of jazz, which really appealed to him. And they were never static, always moving, and that's how he would explain it. And uh, when I joined the chambers, a few days after I joined, uh, I had an allergic rhinitis attack, sneezing, sneezing, my eyes watering. 
And so he came down from court and I heard, heard, saw, my, saw my state. He said, I said, you've got a cold. I said, no, no, sorry, it's not a cold, it's allergic, right? No, 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 you're not looking at all well. I think you should go home. And I was so deeply to this concern. It was only later that I discovered that it was not concern for me. It was solely illness was abhorrent and the common cold was his greatest enemy. So anybody with a common cold, and you would, if it was in a conference, you would ask that person to leave or go to uh, air conditioning. In fact, it didn't like only in conferences, even in court. I remember once when a judge sneezed, he immediately covered his face. That was solely in his illness. But you know, today, when so much is spoken about secularism, or rather a lack of secularism, when solely not just merely talked, he never talked of secularism, he never, he just practiced secularism. For him, there was no question of religion, community, race, none of that. His best friend was Yusuf Karmali, a Muslim. His chambers, he had Obed Chinoy and Ashraf Jidatullah. He had among Hindus, he had uh, uh, Ganesh and uh, Avinash Rana. And uh, I, I remember a senior Parsi solicitor coming to him and telling him, uh, Soli, you've got your own chambers now, chamber number eight. You must encourage the Parsis. You don't have any Parsis at all. So he said, I don't select people by race or religion. There are persons who I like, persons who've come to me, and they're in my chambers. So I'm not going to be completely communal in that sense. So that was Soli. And in fact, I am eternally grateful to Soli for having introduced me to a case which left, left a lasting memory. This was the Karimboy Ibrahim Baranatsi case where uh, the matter was in the appeal court. And so the solicitor went to Soli and wanted to brief him along with Nani who was conducting the matter. And Soli was either busy or otherwise. Anyhow, he suggested to the solicitor, why don't you brief young Chagla? I was a very young Chagla then. And this was an experience which was never to be forgotten, to have worked with and appeared with Nani Paltriwala in that matter. Nani, with his usual grace and courtesy, oh, heaps of praise and fantastic research. From that. In fact, I just about found six or seven authorities and taken them to him. But that was something which I'm eternally grateful to Soli for. And uh, it's... Uh, for Zina, Zia, uh, and the boys, Jangir, Holmas, Chamshid, uh, what became, started as a professional relationship then became a friendship. And for my wife and myself, it was like a family. And for them, for Zoli and Zina, my father was always referred to affectionately as dad. And it was an affection which was wholly reciprocated by him. He just loved being there, being at dinner with them, enjoying their company, talking of not just the law, but literature and poetry, etc. And I don't think Soli would want us to mourn at all. I think he would say that, look, after 90 years, You've had a full life. And let's get hold of that rare malt that Venu Gopal gave me. Let's open that malt and listen to an album of many good. And that's, I think, what he would want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Iqbal. And now I request uh, Justice Mukul Mudgal, he's here, to share his tribute to Mr. Soli Surabji with us. Over to you, Mukul. You are there. I saw you just now. Anyway, so we. He's there. Uh, he's on mute. He's, there, he he, he's on mute. Uh, Justice Mudgal, can you unmute, please? 
Yes. Is that all right now? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. We can hear you, see you, please. Okay. Okay, fine. Uh, uh, Zena and the members of Surabhi family, my seniors from the bar uh, and friends. I first saw Soli argue in the emergency against the emergency and MISA detainees and found his arguments to be forceful, crisp, and brief. My next association with him arose as an opponent. I was an amicus curiae in the Sunil Batra prison reforms case. He was the additional solicitor general at that time. And to my surprise, he gave me authorities, he cited authorities which helped the cause of prison reform. Such was a man who showed what a law officer ought to be and what the law officer should not always do the government line, but do the right thing. Thereafter, my association came in the Bhopal gas review case. Solely at Attorney General constituted a team. And I want to say that none of the members of the team were from his chambers. The team was Mr. C.S. Vedanathan, Mr. Raju Ramchandran, Mr. Ravindra Bhatt, Mr. Justice Khanvilka, um, M.S. Ganesh. And all of us, I mean, we had no direct association with Soli. He just saw, yes, these person, persons have passion for justice, and he chose us. That is the, the remarkable quality he had. The other thing I'd like to mention is that the Soli never cared for money, in the sense, when 1989, about 13 cricketers were banned by the BCCI for two, playing an unofficial match, I requested Soli whether he would like to appear free of cost because I was doing the matter pro bono also. He willingly accepted and devoted all his time to the case. And I must recount a very funny moment in the case. Uh, this was being heard by Chief Justice Venkatamaya's court. And uh, there used to be mentioning in Chief's court, but this was a special bench and solely as usual would come right at the moment, you know? So because there was no mentioning, the matter started. And I was quite nervous. There were about 20 seniors on the other side uh, engaged by the BCCI and the various state associations. And while I was about opening my mouth and mostly warm air coming out, suddenly, Soli rushes in from the back and to, uh, and to his great credit and his great advocacy, he said, Milana, I'm sorry. I was coming from the fine leg boundary. Everybody laughed and the moment was uh, saved. Then I remember his love for freedom of speech and expression. And two cases, especially with cinema censorship, or S. Rangarajan and Bandit Queen, where I had been associated with him, successful in winning judgment from the Supreme Court. I was also, he also associated with me in the Kushwan Singh versus Menga Gandhi case, another case which he fought, and again, free of charge for freedom of speech and expression. The soul, he had a great sense of humor. He was a terrific mimic. And he was a gourmet. He loved to give dinners at his place where people from various walks of life would be available to interact with. He took special care that the best dansak is prepared for a vegetarian like me. And I thoroughly enjoyed this, even though most of the other diners were not vegetarians. He took special care. And I would only say that we have to celebrate the great life of Soli Surabhi, his fantastic achievements. And above all, he was a humane person and loved life, lived life. Thank you. Thank you, Mukul. Uh, now we have the Solicitor General of India, Mr. Tushar Mehta, he's joined us. Over to you. Tushar. Thank you, Basin Sahib. Am I audible? Yes, and visible. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Asim and all my senior friends and colleagues. Uh, I am not very fortunate to have appeared much with Soli, but I have mostly have the experience, leisure and privilege of briefing him and assisting him in large number of matters. From my experience of Soli so far, I can say one thing, picking up from where uh, Justice Mudgal ended, that Soli's life was a life where his death need not be mourned, but his life needs to be celebrated. There are three qualities which appeal to me. Quality as a counsel, quality as a human being, and quality as a senior. All three qualities were qualities of a great human being a giant of a man, which rarely comes into this world and maintains their relevance in whichever field they had. Friends, to leave 90 years or 90 plus is not very difficult. If you have a healthy lifestyle, if you try enough, you may possibly leave up to 90. But to leave up to 90 and be relevant in your field makes you larger than what normal human beings are. As a human being, Soli had a tremendous sense of humor, a very rare sense of humor, and a towering personality which enabled him to use that sense of humor freely and at times fearlessly. I remember having to brief him in a very big case. And during the conference, he said, Tushar, the judges may ask that it is for the plaintiff to prove his case. He can't rely upon the lacunas of defendant's case. In my immaturity, <clears throat> I said, sir, would it, it's a very fundamental question. Would it be necessary for us to find out judgments? He said, no, no, you find out judgments and keep some judgments ready. Overnight, we worked and kept some judgments ready. It was a very settled proposition. We found it. Empty. And as he predicted, at, by 11.30, one of the honorable judges, who is also no longer now, asked, but as a defendant, you have not proved anything. So far, it was a routine affair. But it was solely who was appearing. And his reaction was, he looked at me and said, look, now look. This young boy told me in the conference yesterday that this is a very fundamental question of law, which even a law student will not ask. I still insisted that he must have judgments with him. Now I'll give you the judgments. <laughs> and the judges also burst into a huge laughter. You need to have a sense of humor. You need to have a presence of mind and above all, you need to have the height of saying this and getting away before the bench. So he had that. Whenever I went to meet him after I shifted to Delhi, he used to talk everything except law. That was the condition he always used to put. Making fun of my habit of not drinking. He would crack jokes on non-drinkers. He was an amazing lover of poetry. English poetry, he would recite uh, depending upon the situation he's placed in. A man who always carried a very healthy smile on his face, which was contagious. Whenever I have met him, I found myself enriched, encouraged, and inspired. He never needed to do anything extra to inspire people. His mere presence, his mere words, his mere routine talk was enough to inspire someone. 
friends such a human being come rarely soli was one such human being let us not mourn his death because he lived his life on his own terms and he lived it fully he gave more to the society than the society gave to him this is the time to celebrate the life he lived soli never dies soli will always remain in our memory in our anecdotes in several judgments which he helped the court assist in laying down and will always be remembered fondly i really thank uh, for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to say something about an individual i have always admired thank you so much thank you tushar for those for the tribute rare tribute to a great man and now we have another stalwart a young stalwart i don't consider him to be a very senior stalwart but a young stalwart carrying you see a big head on his shoulder that is darais kambata who is uh, who has been the advocate general of the state of maharashtra and the additional solicitor general besides holding many other positions so over to you darais please thank you lalit you know every time i saw soli or soli uncle as i knew him those famous words of dean erwin griswold of the harvard law school came to mind who it's famously said that the only true language of a lawyer is poetry soli was a poet in his heart i think he was also a clarinetist that was how he was in person that was how he was in court most of us have seen his mastery in court he read a judge magnificently he sensed the pulse of a matter and the moment that he felt that a judge was going in a certain direction he immediately could reorient his entire argument and the day was won and he buttressed this with magnificent oratory with a great knowledge of law with sound principles of law to make a compelling argument in every case it was a treat to watch him he always endeavored to unclutter his mind in the matter of irrelevant facts and and i remember sometimes this could have a disconcerting effect we were getting ready for a final hearing in the supreme court and we were sitting in his chambers and after about 20 minutes or half an hour i think he had more than grasped the point but of course the client and some of the other advocates went on and on and at that point you could see that soli just switched off his attention then was engaged by the draft that he felt was coming from his air conditioner and for the next 45 minutes he had that adjusted and readjusted much to the consternation of the client the client was in a flap he said my matter is tomorrow but he was more concerned about his air conditioner but of course he didn't realize that all soli was doing was decluttering the conference of all those digressionary materials and discussions he had already got the heart of the matter and he showed it in court the next day he was wonderful in reading a court i remember you know, just as mudgal mentioned the bandit queen matter i remember waiting in the court for my matter which was after the bandit queen matter and hearing soli and it was a bench i think of then chief justice barucha justice amadi as he then was justice kirpal and there was some resistance from the bench initially uh, given the language that had been used in the film and at that point soli completely disarmed them by reminding justice barucha of certain members of the bar in the bombay high court including from his own chambers who used to use foul language almost as punctuation and grammar and he told justice barucha that if they had been recorded they too would have been censored and can you imagine doing that and that the bench just melted on hearing that and he he succeeded just on that his passion as we know was the freedom of the human spirit free speech free thought and that's why he loved jazz unshackled music poetry this dominated his life and work and please do not underestimate this as something light hearted because he had a spine and he showed that during the emergency 
when he displayed rare courage to fight for civil liberties when all were seemingly lost. Throughout his life, he remained unwavering in his credo that respect for constitutional liberties was the true underpinning of a great democracy and of a free society. In a sense, he exemplified the spirit of a diverse India. Just imagine, he came from a patrician Parsi family from Bombay, utterly westernized, perhaps born with a silver spoon in his mouth. But he always fought for the underdog. He gave voice to the weakest. And when he had his national platform, he used it in the fullest measure to give voice to freedom of speech, freedom of thought, and to the importance of all of this. He always championed the cause of civil liberties and human rights. And yet he remained, for me, a Bombay boy. He loved his city, he loved Mableshwa, in which he had a house, Valley View. And in fact, one of my earliest memories is trotting over one afternoon with my father, who was an old friend of his, and sitting on that spacious veranda at Valley View. Soli was listening to the Mozart violin concertos when we arrived. And we had a wonderful afternoon. I was a young child, but I just enjoyed the flow of conversation. It, lurched from the philosophical to the banal to the ridiculous. And that was how he was. He loved his walks in the leafy forests of Mableshwa. He loved going to a little leafy enclave below the polo ground where he would sit on a chair and read poetry. And I remember once or twice going to fetch him with his son, including on one great occasion when his son's dog, Scarius, was frightened by the monkeys. And so he immediately took command and posted us at different ends of the forest so as to calm, to catch, and then calm Scarius. And he was in, he delighted in being in that atmosphere, in that free atmosphere. As we know, friends were very important to Soli and he to them. There was this golden gang in college of which my father was a part, but of course, Changu Gagrat, Yusuf Karmali, the great genius Meenu Dava, the gem of gems, Suresh Mirajka. And later, of course, this gang was joined by Obed Chunoy and Avinash Rana. They would speed off to Mableshwa and Soli's Dodge. And the exploits and stories that we heard from Mableshwa are perhaps best saved for a more intimate gathering and not in this sort of a public gathering. But that was Soli. He was a free spirit. He loved his friends. He loved his life. And yes, today is a celebration. But every time I hear or will hear a syncopated note, a beautiful poem, some purple prose, or an intellectual argument in court, I know that Soli cannot be far away. So I would tell his family, Zina auntie, of course, Zia, Jangir, Jamshed, Hormuz, do not mourn him. Live his life, he lived his life well, and remember him in that in that mold. And with these words, I would commend you to think back happily on all the great times with him. I think he's best exemplified by this. The battle is now won. And as the campfire burns, as if on swallow's wings, heavenward, the poet warrior returns. Thank you. Thank you, Darius. I think as uh, most of us know, Soli had a great love for legal education, improving the standards of legal education. And he himself visited the law schools, gave lectures. And it is, I think, a befitting tribute to him. If we have one of the most eminent law teachers now, before I request Zia to say a few words, Professor Venkat Rao, who has been, you see, a pillar for the legal education and setting up along with Professor Menon, you see, the Bangalore National Law School, and then Wits, and wearing so many hats. So I'll now request uh, Professor Venkat Rao to please share his tribute to Mr. Soli Swarabji. Mr. Thank you very much, Lalit Bashanji. My pronouns to members of uh, uh, Shodi family. Uh, indeed, uh, the last day of uh, 
the cruelest month as poet T.S. Eliot has called April has given us the unkindest parting shot by snatching from Emishtas the ever smiling one and only Sodhi. And uh, the words of Hamlet come to my mind. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason. How infinite in faculties. In form and moving, how express and available. In action, how like an angel. That's what Soli is. Who, with his clear thinking, elegant expression, brilliant quote craft, has shaped the constitution to displace the country. Coming to National Law School, where I was the Vice Chancellor for 2009 to 2019, we had the privilege of uh, the visit of Sholi Shalabji on two occasions. Once on 14th October 2009, he visited National Law School of India University to unveil the portrait of its uh, senior Nani Palkiwala in our library. I still remember the three words from Jorastian religion we spoke by addressing the student. He said, only I'm using one sentence, he said, Humata, Hukata, and Huvastha. Good words, good thoughts, and good deeds. This is what my senior Nani practiced. And we feel surely has practiced throughout his life only good words, good thoughts, and good deeds. The second time he gave us the benefit of his erudition was on 5th April 2014, when as a part of silver jubilee lectures by eminent persons, surely delivered a wonderful lecture on rule of law and its dimensions. I remember that lecture because the way he answered a question of one of our young students, when the young student asked, sir, your contribution in Keswan and the Bharati's case is outstanding. But can you tell us anything about the weak points in Keswan and the Bharati? The student asked. Then, you know, Soli, in his winful smile, he said, that it's undoubtedly an outstanding judgment. But apparently, I quote, the judgment reflects a national trait against brevity, he said. Which is, uh, partially evident in the speeches of ministers, politicians, the legal submissions of some eminent juries, and also the judgments of Apex Court, Keswan and the Bharati not accepting that was the parting shot he gave to us. And when we invited him, he said, the only request I have is, uh, please give me a wheelchair. And we provided him the wheelchair, after the lecture was over, there was a gap of five hours. Then he said, I would like to go to your library and spend a couple of hours. And I accompanied him. And on the way, he was interacting with the students. Then I told Shori, sir, I'm reminded of your favorite poem, Rudyard Kipling's If. And in that poem, you had a famous line, he worked with kings, yet he has not lost a common touch. You have worked with kings, but you have not lost the common that you are interacting with those students. He patted me on my back and in the library said, how I wish I spent the rest of my life in this wonderful place, which has so much of ambience. That was so the once, only one sentence. We admire your legal acumen, Soli, but we love your solid office. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Professor Venkatrao. Uh, I'm informed that uh, one other very close colleague and associate and contemporary of Soli and Fali and others, that is Mr. Murli Bhandare. He's also waiting in the, in the program here. So I request Mr. Murli Bhandare to please... Uh, share his views, Mr. Bandare. In Sholi Divine, I have lost one of my longest and the closest friends. We were together in the government law college. I still remember the first day I met him 
we shook hands and he gave a very broad smile. You can you see to start smiling with even now. And with an open mouth. I will never forget that day because later on that open mouth made him the best champion for the freedom of expression and speech. I am so de de dejected and feeling sad that he is no more because he was always a very warm friend, a friend for 71 years, which is very rare. I attended his wedding, his 91st birthday, and after he spoke, he asked me to speak. Anyway, I wished him at that time to score a century, which, which is, did not come. But I must tell you that even in the law college, we had a parliament. And Pali, who spoke earlier, was the speaker. Anil Diwan was the prime minister. I was the defense minister. And Choli was the leader of the opposition. And do you know what bill the parliament of the government law college Bombay passed? It passed an anti-black market bill act, anti-black market act. So you can imagine how we were ahead of the country at that, that time. Now, very rare that five friends, myself, Pali Nariman, Anil Diwan, Ashok Desai, and Choli Sauravji, all of us moved from Mobile High Court to the Supreme Court. And I must tell you that laws have the unique opportunity of meeting his friends every day because they go to the court meet in the bar or library or in the bar canteen and all other places where they are there. This is not open to other profession or any other way of life. And therefore, I have been meeting him for 71 years, almost every day, and he, his wife also Gina, about whom I have got great admiration. I must tell you that we had one common passion, that is the common cause of justice. Truly was a champion of free speech and appeared in every leading case when protect, which protected and promoted the right of speech and expression. I really missed a close friend, but nation has lost one of the great laws. And above all, I remember him because he was a great human right, human right especially, and he also was very fond of music, and he started a yeah, yeah. big jazz festival oh. in the big jazz festival in, in, in Delhi. Delhi. And I never missed the program and the delight of that music which was by in the jazz festival. 
Choli was the chair. Last. Choli. Choli said. Last one. Yes. I must tell you that their words are not enough to say accurate to say fully what I feel about Choli. I have lost a friend, but nation has lost a great play. Play. I will surely will be remembered to Dina, Dia, Changir, Orman, his grandchildren, and the many battles he fought and won for justice. For justice, for justice. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Bandare. Thank you very much. Oh, now, before I ask the other speakers, I think it is now high time that I wish I should request uh, Ms. Ria Modi, the illustrious uh, daughter of a great lawyer. She herself is a very, very leading lawyer, not only known within the country but even outside heading one of the topmost law firms of this country. So over to you, Zia, please. Thank you so much, uh, Lalit, for bringing this absolutely wonderful, touching memorial for my father. I was a and grateful. Uh, my mom, Jahangir, my brother Jamshid and Hormuz uh, really, really appreciate that all of you have taken the time and trouble to listen to stuff about Papa. So I think enough has been said about his acumen and the mark that he has left. Uh, I think that, you know, there were some parts about Daddy that maybe some of you knew. One is that he was an absolute foodie. And uh, every time mommy would scold him about eating some more sweets, he would complain. Jhangir would promptly increase his dose of insulin probably. And I would scold my mother to say, let him be now. What do you tolerate? Why do you scold him all the time? On this? He loved his food. And I remember he had once gone for a meal in London uh, where a law firm called Clifford Chance was hosting me and daddy. And he was looking very upset throughout the meal. And I said, but daddy, problems with chair. It's, uh, don't you like the food? I mean, you know, it's good food. He's saying it's fabulous food, but I left my dentures in the hotel. So I can't taste anything properly. So he was going away at the salmon, couldn't taste it, and was most upset for the rest of the evening. But he was very happy that he didn't have to spend on me when he took me to Europe because I was vegetarian. And he used to keep saying, very good pizza, darling, must have pizza. He used to complain my mother spent far too much money by ordering steak all the time. And he was very happy that all of us as Baha'is didn't drink liquor so that he didn't have to spend on booze on his kids. But really, I think that, you know, the other part of my father, for some of you who may have experienced it, is that for these fabulous memory if daddy didn't think it was important he never remembered anything that he didn't want to remember he would switch off the minute he didn't think it was relevant i would be talking to my father on the phone and within three minutes of the conversation i used to say daddy 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 they're not listening and he would say, ah, chalo, chalo. Bye bye, darling. And he would put the phone down. If he was not interested in what was happening, you were gone. You were done. I remember he came home once, or my mother, and I think daddy also told me this story. He went to Dungarwadi, came home quite upset, and I think scolded my mother because he had gone and wished and consoled the person whose parent had died and said, so sorry about Papa. And the guy said, but Mama Gujriya. So he was most upset that my mother or somebody had not correctly informed him 
as to who had passed away. But Papa didn't remember when he didn't want to remember. On the other hand, when he wanted to remember, there was no matching what he wanted to do. I remember as a junior, one of the rare occasions he came to Bombay. And Avinash Rana was assisting him in a case where the owners of a toothpaste called, not toothpaste, an Ayurvedic medicine called Vajradanti was up for excise challenge. The promoter said that they were an Ayurvedic medicine and the government was saying your toothpaste, pay us excise on toothpaste. So these poor promoters were busy briefing daddy in a long conference after two hours, Avinash was assisting them. And as they were walking out of chamber number eight, daddy calls the owner and says in Marathi, Are, uh, toothpaste ki just give me the toothpaste. And the guy picked up the Vajradanti packet and gave it to daddy. And he said, how can you say you are Ayurvedic medicine? You've called yourself a toothpaste in this conference. So I never forgot how well prepared you really need to be when you get there. Other things about daddy, the common cold, absolutely legendary. When I got a cold, I remember the door used to open for literally six inches. I would be asked, Kimcha darling, everything all right? And the door would close again, lest, you know, some germs infected him along the way. My mother had a cold. She had to leave the bedroom and go and sleep in the study on a mattress, lest he got a cold for arguing the next day. So these are all little things about Papa that, you know, we celebrate and we remember. I know how fond he was of all his juniors. He really took pride in the way that they flourished, succeeded, surpassed, and made him so proud. We always used to ask him and tease him, who was the junior you're proudest of? And I'm happy, Harish, to say it was always Harish. He was always asked, who was your brightest junior? He would always say, Harish. And when the younger juniors me. Ashim, who I can't even call because I think both of us will be bawling our eyes out if we talk to each other. He was absolutely so happy that they could chart their own path to success. Arun Jaitley was a special person in his life. After Arun passed, he just could not handle even talking about Arun without breaking down. And so these were small things we remember. As a young junior, I remember my father telling me as a counsel. Don't worry about clients, darling. Remember, all clients are necessary evils. You are an officer of the court. Don't ever forget that that is your first duty. You are an officer of the court. And he always used to tell me, if you say one thing that is wrong, you have not lost the trust of that judge. You have lost the judge, the trust of the court because they all have have lunch and talk about it at the lunch table. So don't worry about the client. You preserve your reputation. And these were the things that we grew up with. We were so taken for granted because the values came so naturally to us and we were not required to test them. They were simply part of the DNA. I remember when I started practicing corporate law as opposed to litigation and these People would say, run a conflict check, run a conflict check. I was very confused because I was just learning, you know, what is this conflict check? So I remember phoning and asking uh, Papa, Papa, these conflict checks, how do you realize if it's a conflict or not? I mean, what do you have to do to say it's a conflict? And I'll never forget the advice that he gave me and which I give all to all our lawyers at EZB. He said, if it doesn't feel right, darling, it's a conflict. Just go with your instinct and go with your judgment. So, you know, I want to leave all of you with a lot of good memories that all of you have to celebrate my father's life, his greatness, and to keep him in your memory and smile whenever an incident comes to your mind. I got a lovely SMS from Sanaya today to say that, did you know that your father's grave is two graves away from Babsi's and they are going to be there together for eternity? And so I wrote back to her and I said that whenever anyone goes to pray, either at Babsi's grave or at Papa's grave, make sure they pray for each other. And so I think that, you know, wherever both of them are, wherever daddy is, and thank you all of you for really all your affection. 
We have such a legacy to be proud of. I hope we can in some way make him proud of us. And we just pray for his soul and the happiness of the next life. Thank you. Thank you, Zia. I think we all have very good memories, very pleasant memories. And we will cherish those memories. But along with memories, we also have, you see, what values he conveyed to all of us and particularly to younger generation of the lawyers. And as I said earlier, we are going to institutionalize some of these things in his name so that the message and which his life gives, you see, can be carried on. We have... Uh, I think two more uh, speakers and Mr. I request Dr. Manoj Kumar, uh, who is the managing partner of Humarabi Solomon. You, he's also the vice president uh, of SILF. To so please give his address and I request that uh, please be very brief. We are already running into, you see, some late timing. Uh, Mr. Dr. Manoj Kumar, please. Nalit, I also would like to speak. Avina Shana from Hong Kong. Yes, Dr. Manoj Kumar, please. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Basini. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, it has been uh, quite moving hearing everybody, uh, you know, contemporaries, uh, and and everybody else is the morning. So good evening, my friends, my colleagues and most importantly, my elders uh, who are present here today. I just want to talk very briefly about uh, the gratitude that uh, we youngsters hold uh, to the likes of uh, Mr. Soli Sorabji. Takes me back to the days when um, and, uh, we, we were aspiring lawyers. And in those days, uh, Professor Menon had uh, set his experiment uh, rolling of National Law School. And when we applied for the law school, we got a brochure, about a 30-page brochure. And the Overleaf had a list of luminaries uh, who were the visiting faculty and, and so to support uh, the initiative. And of course, it had the likes of uh, Mr. Nariman here, uh, who's here with us, Mr. K.K. Venugopal, the Attorney General, and of course, a lot many others, uh, about seven or eight names, including uh, Mr. Sorabji. So that was the uh, you know, legacy and inspiration for even aspiring lawyers that we started with. Um, then fast forward five years of interaction with him during his visits to law school and then into the profession in the mid nineties. As a young lawyer, uh, liberalization was uh, underway and, and uh, as young lawyers, we got a lot more opportunities uh, to do uh, disputes work, some very groundbreaking work uh, not being from a family of lawyers, it was a new ground to cover. All we had was the hard work we had put in and the training uh, during law school. On multiple occasions, we had uh, the necessity to uh, work with Mr. Soli Swarabji, whether it's the concession agreement issue and the entire fate of the uh, highway uh, projects, the way it had to be over the last 20 years, or the entire disinvestment which was underway uh, in the 2000s by the then dispensation. So in fact, the entire governance agenda, which had to be, which had to pass through the test of the court, uh, we had multiple occasions to work with Mr. Sri and learn from him and from his wisdom. Quickly to wind up, I want to pick up from where Mr. Tushar Mehta and many other speakers left about uh, 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 Mr. Surabji being full of life and living life on his own terms. And I could find a poetry which, in my view, reflects uh, Soli's outlook towards life and beyond. And I quote, when your time comes to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with fear of death. So that when their time comes, they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives all over again in a different way. Sing your death song and die like a hero going home. As Ralph Emerson said, uh, which fits into the legacy of Mr. Soli Sorabji, it is the secret of the world that all things subsist and do not die. 
but only retire a little from sight and afterwards return again. The likes of Soli, my friends, uh, just like Jesus, they never die. They never, he never die, died. Soli is very well alive in our hearts. Long live Soli. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manoj Kumar. We also have uh, Mr. Prashant Kumar. He is the president of the Bar Association of India. They paid a big homage and tribute yesterday only. Uh, and uh, Mr. Prashant Kumar, are you there? If you can very briefly want to add something. Prashant, no? Okay, so Mr. Avinash Rana, again a very, very distinguished uh, member of the Indian Bar, a very close friend, you see, of uh, Soli Swarabji. So over to you, Mr. Rana, very briefly, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Yes, yes, we can hear you, Avinash. Uh, thank you very much, Lalit. Uh, I'm speaking from Hong Kong. Uh, everybody has said about Soli, how great lawyer he was, about his interest in literature and poetry, it was incredibly amazing. It was a real great mimic. Whether it was Hormazi Sirvai or Sorli Sorabji, one did not know and make a mistake and make a fool of oneself. Uh, Soli and I, we were together in a number of cases in the High Court as well as the Supreme Court. I don't recall a single moment where there was tension or unpleasantness. So a great leader and a great friend. Soli, always and I, we are three individuals, but with one heart and soul. We miss him very much. Uh, with his uh, demise, a part of me has died. I am 93 years old, and I never thought that Soli would go before me. I earnestly pray to God to give divine and loving peace to his very noble soul, and my heartfelt condolences to Zia, Zina, Hormas, Jangir, and Jamshed. I love them and offer my best wishes to them. God bless you. Yeah. We will now have the last interview, possibly the last interview of uh, Mr. Soli Swarabji, recorded only in February 2021. It's a short interview, 20, 19 minutes. So please share. <coughs> Standard prayer. OK. So once my son went and asked him, will you please, please see George Brown? Are you sorry, sir, of your son? Oh, that's how, that's how he remembered. That, that's the kind of connection. <laughs> said, Are you sorry, sir, of your son? Yeah. Hi, Soli, sir. Welcome to Behind the Bar, literally and metaphorically. First of all, thank you so much for giving your time for this show. No, no, thank you for having me. So before I start this show, I just want to talk a little about the intention of our show. I believe that it is very important for the people to know about the life of a jurist, both in a professional way 
and in a personal sense. So this is why we are making this show so that people come to know what a life of a jurist is. And my secret is around. <laughs> no, sir. So sir, Soli sir, you're known as the Babbar Sher or the Lion of the Bar. That's what they call you. But sir, what I want to know from you first is how were you as a child? Were you an obedient child? Were you a notorious kid? How were you as a child? I was only child, only son. Okay, sir. Only son and child. So I was pampered. But I was always interested in books and music from an early age. And then when the war declared, and the Japanese invasion took place, Singapore, Malaysia, at that time we had a different feeling altogether. We used to go out otherwise to hill stations that we couldn't go. So only went to places like Mathuram, Mahamleshwar, and spent the band there. But I followed the war very closely. Okay. For example, I remember Churchill saying, they'd fight them on the beaches, they'd fight them in the air. We shall never surrender. Mainly I spent the time during the war watching the progress of the war. And when the U.S. entered, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, and Roosevelt said, they opened to me, that changed my whole thing. Okay. I was always fond of Americans. American jazz music I liked, Americans I liked. And then it was a peculiar thing. Subhash Chandra Bose was the Japanese. He was supposed to be the leader of the national movement. At the same time, people looked upon him as a rebel. It was a funny feeling. But very interesting times, war times. And I remember the explosion that took place in Bombay. Yes, sir. June 1944. Yes, sir. And there were friends with me. Charles Correa was with me. We were both together when it happened. And um, my good memories are of my professors, of my teachers in um, various school and college. School was Father Bonnet, very fine person, taught me literature. And then <laughs> College was, of course, for the bell. And there was a uh, most interesting time was cricket match between Edmondson and Davis. Davis. Okay. So, so how did this idea of pursuing law come into your mind? Law? Yes, sir. I was not interested in trade and business. I didn't like the ways of business people. I got to please the X, please Y. So I didn't like that. No, because of profession, which, which you can are uh, independent. You're not bound by anyone saying anything to you. And you can really, I thought, do some service to society by be making people aware of their rights. And apart from making them aware of their rights, fight for the rights, which are sometimes suppressed very sure, then the emergency was suppressed very badly. So, so in 1953, when you started your practice, I've always seen that this, since last 70 years, you have focused a lot on the constitutional right, which is freedom of speech and expression. So, sir, what made you think that it is that constitutional right which needs to be focused in India? Frankly, frankly, without free speech and freedom of expression, democracy is a mockery. So that has to be kept alive. But of course, it's not absolute. It's subject to reasonable restrictions, that's what Article 19 to itself provides. Freedom of speech can be restricted, with reasonable restrictions, and one of the heads of restrictions is the contempt of court. So you can say the judge is lazy, okay. The judge is fat, okay. But if you say the judge is corrupt in the sense he only favors one community, or it is favors another community, or he takes on gratification, then there's a matter in which they cannot, I don't believe that truth is no defense and contempt. On the contrary, in such cases, let the people, person who makes the allegation, give him an opportunity to prove it. If he fails to prove it, punish him. But don't prevent him from making good allegations. That's right. By saying that truth is no defense 
in her contempt proceeding. So what do you think now in uh, now it's been 70 years since you started your practice. So how has freedom of expression evolved in this country now? Well, actually it's not as vigorous as before. It has to not displease the authorities. At the same time, there are people who speak out. And even, even if it means taking out the neck for that purpose. But freedom of speech and expression, people think it is something philosophical. It is not. It is a reality. Without that, people in India cannot know their rights. People cannot know how to come to executive excesses. So to that extent, to my mind, freedom of speech is very important. And if you don't have freedom of speech, there hardly any freedom at all. So what do you think about what happened with Mr. Prashant Bhushan uh, some time back? Well, Prashant Bhushan is a person of strong convictions. He has paid that fine of one rupee. Actually, the trouble is, Prashant Bhushan and some others don't say the judge was wrong. Right. The judge was corrupt. I want to say, but the, before you say he was corrupt, there must be some evidence. At the same time, you can't prevent him from dealing that evidence. That's my thing. You can't say, no, we don't want that you deal the evidence. Because as it said, we're a contempt of course, saying that. But he's a very brave person, a very resourceful person. I knew as a young man, I knew his father very well, Shanti Bhushan was the Roman minister. After the emergency was over, he was the Home Minister. He is the one who persuaded me to come to Delhi. Okay, okay, sir. And take up the post. So that's how you came from. Yeah. yeah okay. And sir, uh, talking about like when you were practicing, uh, we all know that Mr. Nani Palkiwala is one of the biggest lawyers, and you've shared a close. Finest, finest. And so you've shared a, a very close relationship with him. Oh yes. So if you can tell us some very interesting moment which has always stayed with you. Some of his teachings, if you could tell, for the young budding lawyers also, it will be very inspirational and motivational. You see, he never believed in long arguments, in repeating arguments, believed in short arguments to the point, and he drove home the point. And he knew how to the move of the bench. He, knew, he, he never alienated any judges. He knew how to deal with them, how to handle them. And apart from that, we belong to the same community. We spoke in Gujarati, we cag jokes in Gujarati. And he used to come to a place in Mahabeshwa. And then he used to sleep in the garden. But we couldn't stay for a day more. Next day we would be back, back to Bombay. But very fine person, very simple, humble. And I never forget one thing. At his house, we used to have a break-up dinner parties in Bombay. So, we used to buy something charitable person. For party or he had come to party or house. Party or was the first house host. He saw him down to the car and gave him a check of two crores. Okay. And he didn't want that to be mentioned. That was his thing. I remember his famous saying was also that God pays, but not every week. Uh, he used to say this before. Yeah. And so, uh, talking about your journey further, uh, can you tell us something about that time of emergency? And uh, when you also stood up, I think you were one of the few advocates who stood up for the detainees of press censorship. And there was a Citizens Justice Committee formed. So, can you please take us back? to that time and how how did it happen and what, what exactly was the situation like? We tried our best to speak up for the journalists who were put behind bars or were harassed. And that required a little guts. Because people in the family were scared that you also may be behind bars. But if you believe in something, you should be prepared to fight for it and even to sacrifice some of your personal comfort and liberties. That's right, sir. And that's what happened, and finally, that emergency lasted only, thank God, 19 months or something. Then they were overthrown. And sir, uh, like, you know, we over here are like budding filmmakers. So, there is one film which we have worked on, and 
it always stays with us in our head. So you have fought so many cases, sir. If there is one landmark case of yours which you would like to talk about, some case, some moment which has always stayed with you, which you would like to share with us. I mean, he was one of the St. Xavier's Codus case. Rats of the minorities. Article 25. Learn to preach, profess. That was a very important case. And of course, the other cases are those of detainees for whom he appeared. But you know, it was so embarrassing to find even people who he expected to be bold and spirited, like Chandrachur, Bhagwati. What they do is they leave the so, so, going back now, uh, how was your time when you were uh, the Attorney General of India? And I think it was once in 1977 and then in 1998 again. So, how was that time and when you were re-elected for the second time, how was, what was the difference and if you could just tell us something about that. The difference was that no one tried to influence me as an Attorney General. On the contrary, they listened to me. That this cannot be done, this is wrong. And if you've done this, this should be withdrawn. When I was Attorney General next, I had people like uh, R.N. Jayadi. Okay. Then uh, Kakkar was there. And um, <coughs> who was the other person? Why? Kapil Zibar was also there. Okay, yes, okay. Kapil Zibar was there, okay. Supreme Court was different that time. So, as uh, seven decades have passed now, what do you think about the judiciary today, the lawyers today? Do you think, what, what can be de done for the betterment? What is the scope for betterment in today's democracy? And actually... How do you see it from that time till today? Do you think how evolved, how, how, how much have we evolved and what is the scope of... I think it's become very commercialized. Commercialized. Nothing wrong in making profit. Laws don't live on love and pressure, they got to make, make a living. But if the idea is to make a mini fortune, then don't join the, don't join the legal profession. Go and trade in business. Because after all, it's a profession. You have to fight for the people, fight for the rights of the people, stand up for the rule of law, stand up for the constitution values, and you require a different kind of approach. But if you have that mentality in age, it's a of another, it's a good brief child model, forget about it. That, to my mind, that sort of mentality is slightly growing. Today, this notion of the law as a profession, noble profession, as a fight for people in respect of peace, is receding a bit. Suppose you, you are to take somebody under you today. So, under, under you, like if you, if you are taking somebody as an intern or as if somebody is working under you, what would be the qualities which you would want in him or her to be? First, to be absolutely correct on facts. Never mistreat a court. Never mistreat facts. That's very important. Or you'll be mentally blackballed. That's very important. And then, of course, you, you try and do your best, present both sides of the argument, to present that argument here as a crime. Nothing wrong in that. But don't mis mistreat facts. Don't mislead the court. That's where the legal profession falls into dispute. And the people, and then you get the famous stupid laws and dials and all that sort of thing. But it's difficult also. Depends on circumstances, depends on the present way of thinking in the society also. But there are sure there are people who would live up to the high tradition of the bar. And I think we should encourage them. And if there are some juniors in my chambers, I would like to go out of the way to see that they get briefs with me. If I'm not charging, but they should charge, they should charge properly. And they should be at least get involved in it. They will join the profession as a profession, not as trade and business. That's the important thing. So, sir, on that note, I would like to thank you so much that yeah, you gave you. us your time. And if there is something which you want to say to the audience, you can. There is a message you want to give to the people or the audience who are watching you. People, the audience says, there are some lawyers who will fight for you and fight for your liberties. 
in fact to the constitutional values and see the South North encouraged and respected. That's how we'll get around. But there are no ifs and buts in anything. There's a genuine statement. And I hope the future generation of lawyers becomes less commercial minded and more service minded. Thank you so much, sir. I hope Thank you. you had a good time with us on our show. Oh, yes, sir. You asked many interesting questions. Thank you so much, sir. And hope to see you soon again. And please stay as young as you are and stay like oh, this yes. always. Oh, yes. Thank you. I'm only 65. <laughs>
just tell us yes or no so reluctantly he said yes and at that point of time the public interest litigation got dismissed so this is i mean the brilliant brilliant advocacy on the part of mr suraj ji and i mean this he had not discussed with us he had listened very patiently to all the facts and everything and one small fact he picked up and placed before the court and got rid of this litigation for us which was really a big relief for us and on the way out he said ashok i am going to charge double the fees for you from you for this matter because uh, this is over in one hearing i said yes sir by all means but then i never got that bill he is so so great a man that he never hardly bothered about the money <laughs> so i i will always remember him as a great guide great friend and uh, of course uh, he will always remain in our hearts thank you thank you dr ashok sharma we all will always remember him not only as a great lawyer as a great jurist but also as uh-huh. a great friend you, as a great friend oh, good and uh, i just show you the other thing now finished I, it was finished i thank you see the family i thank zina zia the zia's uh, uh, homer and jahangir and other members of the family for giving us this opportunity to share something and learn from you what soli was in the family life you know you have shared with us some very excellent uh, attributes of soli's personality which are otherwise not known but we have also shared with you something which we know of soli and which over 6 or 7 decades of our association ever since he started his practice so with this i seek your permission to close this it is not a condolence meeting it is a remembrance meeting and this remembrance meeting we will keep on having as i said earlier we will institutionalize this in the memory of a great man that was soli sorabji thank you very much